Dr. Schreiner, what would be your main problem then with this pre-tribulational view in your reading of Scripture? I think I think I'd say fundamentally. I mean, I'm not I'm I'm not a dispensationalist for a number of reasons. Most people who are pre-tribulational are also dispensational, so I, I don't have the same view of Israel and the church. A lot of dispensationalists would say, though, you don't have to be a dispensationalist to be a pre-tribulationalist. Yeah, I I, I know, but I think it is I think it is mainly in dispensational yeah, circles, and. I, w- I would just argue, for example, that what we find in Paul and First Ra- Peter is that the church is the new Israel. So at least, um, I'm, and I don't even know where Dr. Ware stands exactly on all this, but at least typically the, the separation is pretty sharp. Now, in terms of uh, biblical texts, I think Second uh, Thessalonians chapter 1 uh, clearly teaches that the time of relief for the believers in Thessalonica, that time of relief comes at the second coming where it's very clear, I think, in those verses, when Jesus comes to punish the wicked and judge them. I don't think there's any indication there of a temporal difference. I think the most natural reading is it takes place at the same time. First Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, I think the most natural reading is that's not a secret rapture. It's a loud event. He comes with a trumpet. It's loud. It's, it's, uh, it's dramatic. Um, I think there's indications there. Even the word that is used, apontesis, uh, they, they do go up. I think there is a rapture. They go up to meet the Lord in the air, and I think they come back down with him. That word is often used for when a, a dignitary would visit a city. They'd go out to visit that dignitary and then come back in with him to celebrate victory. So I think that's what's going on there. I think, I think this is an art argument from silence, so it's not decisive. I mean, obviously, these texts are hard to put together, but 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the Thessalonians think that the end has come. That, that's quite extraordinary. They think the end has come. If Paul were a pre-tribulationist, he could have solved it by simply saying, and he taught them this, I mean, guys, the end doesn't come. I'm here. I'm here. You're, you're still around. No Christians have been, have been raptured. That, that's got to be the first thing that takes place. But he doesn't say that. He says, you know the end hasn't come because the apostasy hasn't taken place and the man of lawlessness hasn't appeared. So, you know, that's, that's the dog that doesn't bark. It's not, <laughs> it's, not, it's not decisive, but I think it's illuminating because he wants to say the clearest thing to these people who are so confused, and he doesn't say a word about it. Some would argue, of course, that... The number seven might not might be symbolic in some fashion, <clears throat> so it's not a literal seven years. But I, I personally believe it will be. Um, <clears throat> the passage that you cited a moment ago in First Thessalonians five that the day would not uh, that the Christ will come like a thief in the night. He also goes on to say to the Thessalonians, but that day will not overtake you like a thief. You're going to be prepared for it. You know when things start to go bad, and you're going to be ready for the return of Christ. Um, the idea of imminence, certainly there is, a, there is imminence, I would argue, in terms of the beginning of these events. I believe that the sequence could start today, or may have already started yesterday. I don't know. I haven't read the paper this morning. <clears throat> You're one of those kind of guys. Uh, one of those kind of guys, right. <laughs> paper in one hand, a Bible in the other. That's right. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, I think that the, the sequence could begin at any moment, but I, I just am not convinced that there are texts that teach us that Christ could come at any moment without his believers having some expectancy that he's on his way, that it's, th- these things have begun. Uh, one other thing that I let me just add before we move on to something else, uh, in terms of this whole discussion about, about the tribulation, uh, I have for years in theology, the Theology 3 class that I, that I teach, uh, have made this offer to students when we get down to eschatology and dealing with the tribulation. If you can show me one clear, unambiguous, didactic text anywhere in the Bible that teaches that the church will escape the tribulation, you can walk out with an A today, and I've never had to grant that A. Um, the question that keeps coming up that I don't, haven't heard addressed much is, what is the nature of the new heavens and new earth? If you could speak to that. Dr. Brand? I'll, I'll, I'll address that. Uh, by the way, just uh, both of your comments about the... Uh, collegiality. If we had a preterist up here, we'd throw him under the bus. I uh, <laughs> just want to, want to be clear on that. Uh, um, I, I would make a case that, um, that many of the people in our churches 
most of the people in our, the vast majority of the people in our churches have a complete misunderstanding about the eternal state because they're thinking about going to heaven when I die. You know, that's H-E-B apostrophe M, by the way, that's how you spell that. <laughs> going to heaven when I die. And the, the hymnology, most of it that we sing, only stops there. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be, if we even sing that anymore. Um, very few of the people in our churches have any conception of the resurrection of the dead. I mean, wh- where's the hymn that talks about the resurrection of the dead? All right, some of you theological, musical people need to get together on this one and, uh, and put something together. Um, I can only imagine probably comes as close uh, uh, as, as any contemporary Christian song I can think of or hymn. So the, uh, the hymnology doesn't talk about the resurrection of the dead. There's very little focus on the fact that we will dwell eternally in the new earth or in the new heavens and the new earth, that, that instead of going to heaven as the final state, heaven comes to earth. Revelation 21 is real clear about this. And so our eternal state is a physical state. God, we just have a lot of Gnosticism in our churches. It's in, in implicit Gnosticism, but it's there nonetheless. And it's, it's really up to you, it's up to us and up to you, especially you as the next generation, uh, to weed out that implicit Gnosticism when it comes to eschatology. So physically resurrected bodies dwelling on a new earth, and I would say fulfilling the cultural mandate. Uh, exercise dominion. We're, we're in the process of trying to fulfill that now in a fallen age. We ourselves already, but not yet, believers, all right? But in that age, we'll be able to, to fulfill the cultural mandate, to exercise dominion, to see to it that God's kingship is established in every corner of the world forever and ever and ever and ever. And I would argue also that this probably doesn't mean that all we will do during that entire time is to sing hymns. I believe that we will exercise dominion. We will take control of this world. We'll have things to do. We'll have work to do. We'll also be able to enjoy this creation that God has made for us in ways that we cannot possibly enjoy it today. Uh, Whether that means recreation, uh, whether it means we'll all be able to climb Mount Everest and jump off and not worry about it or something like that, I I don't know. I, I, I personally love to fish, so I believe that there will be fishing. Well. Catch and release only, all right? But, uh... Uh, I think that many of our people just have a diminished expectation, and some of this may be fanciful. What about Warp Factor 10? I mean, there's a whole universe out there. Something to think about.